I was not emotional during worship. <laughs> and I thought I could get by, but oh, it is, it is emotional, it is moving, and uh, it's a joy to be here. You know, every, almost every face has a memory, you know, every, uh, some of you have lost your memory, so it's not possible <laughs> with humor there, but um, we've been through a lot, a lot of us, and a lot of moments in time that are very special. You know, every time you're in the presence of God, it's very special, so here again today, it's just sweet to be here in God's presence, and um, anyway, I love you guys a lot. <laughs> oh, but um, how many, let's be honest, are going to live forever? Let's just be candid. You're going to live forever, okay? If you didn't raise your hand, you would like to live forever, okay? Because that's the promise, guys. Uh, this is dress rehearsal for eternity. It's our shortest time in existence as earth, heaven is before us, and so it's just a joy to um, be back at Lay Rock of Roseville. Um, I got, you know, a lot of my heart today. I, I do love and appreciate Brandon. I don't remember looking into your eyes at that moment, but I've, Brandon loves when I look into his eyes. That's one of his favorite, <laughs> favorite experiences in life. <laughs> is it only next to racial? Is it better? <laughs> Oh, but it's a joy to have a great son in the Lord, who I love you dearly, and Rachel. You know, Rachel came to Deborah, my daughter's wedding. That's how they met, um, so a thousand years ago. And just to see what God has done in the church, hearing great reports all the time of what God is doing. And that's a big deal, you know. A multi-generational handoff, guys, is not for the faint at heart, huh, Kirsten? It's not for the faint at heart. Um, it's a big deal to be 70 and hand it off to a 35. Um, generations are very different, and um, it really turned out well. Hi, Mike. Bless you, man. God bless you. But uh, I am honored that it did turn out so well. It's the grace of God. You're just sowing seed over the years of affirming. Um, it's always um, a challenging planet. I mean, it's never like the planet. You know, it's really doing great, and it's just going to get easier. No, in this world, you will have tribulation, and yet be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So I, I'm in a, a next kind of a season, um, but you are too. And there's always a next. We're all in process. I remember as a young Christian, I would say, well, I'm kind of in transition. And then I realized I was saying it every week to people. You know what I'm saying? It's like, at some point, it's redundant, because you're always in a fluid from glory to glory, changing. And, um, and yet some, some seasons are bigger, some handoffs are bigger, some relays are bigger. Um, and I do feel, even on the planet, if I could say that, um, it's a challenging time. Um, challenging time in America, perhaps a challenging time in your life. So I want to help you today, I want to encourage you. Uh, if you're a guy today, I'm going to punch you in the chest. It's going to be good. And because uh, you're a man, right? That's right, so you can handle that. But it's just going to be challenging us to be men who are men. And if you're a lady, then you're a mighty lady. But um, it's also a blessing to, to be with other leaders here. Pastor Bob is a dear friend. I actually called him on Friday left a message somewhere in cyberspace, thinking I might see him again um, here, but he's still en route. Um, but Pastor Bob, Pastor Mark are also magnificent known these men for many years, as well as the many young leaders here, Ryan and, you know, Aaron and others that are here, Sean, just did awesome today. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> All right, and um, so I'm gonna head into the message now, but dads are a big deal. Um, you know, my dad's been gone 53 years. Um, I had a lot of morphing to do in my heart toward him wrote a book called Father Wounds, gives you a hint, a little bit of hint there. So, uh, but I've not had a bad thought about my dad since I wrote Father Wounds, which became a journaling process. And so I believe sometimes um, it takes a while to get healed. I remember one point I was standing with a pastor, 
uh, from Australia, and I had not seen him in a few years. And we both had father issues, and uh, so I just said, hey, how you doing with your dad deal? And he said, you know, at one point I just stopped looking for a father and just decided to be a father. I remember that moment, it was like, you know, whoa. That's a place I need to go. And that's the irony of life. I called today, I called my spiritual father in the Lord, who's 85 or 6. And I said, You going to church today? He goes, I am the church. <laughs> he goes, <"That's> so cute. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. But he is going to church as well. But anyway, he just. Then I called my older brother, who's been like a father to me at different points. He's 86. So. Um, and so the father issue, um, for whatever reason, all of us. Long for a dad. You know, the Bible says, and here's a verse I trust will be on the screen, Proverbs 17, the glory of children is their father. It's an ornament we display around our neck. The great news is you have an amazing heavenly father. If you get to know him, it's going to be awesome. We're going to spend eternity getting to know him. Um, for those of us who are fathers, we're still in process, you know. One of my daughters called today, the other daughter is on a cruise, so I couldn't call me from the boat, but um, call me today and I appreciated that. I'm always hoping um, to be a good dad. Seven grandkids, so I want to be a great grandfather to them. But I want to talk to you today, um, whether or not you had a natural father who's healthy, you have a spiritual father in heaven who is healthy. and. We also can be fathers to many. I'll trust, I'll assure you, there's everyone out there. I have, tomorrow morning, I'll meet with someone at seven and another person at eight. Uh, both of them, there's father things going on there uh, in their lives. And so, it goes on. I want to talk to you today about being a hero. Um, all of us, really, I believe in our heart of hearts, would like to be heroes, meaning, uh, we would like to do something heroic. One of the great ironies of life, uh, morphine uh, was an addictive thing. They thought it would be a great help to people, but it became addictive. And then they found a cure for a morphine addiction. And they gave it a really uh, romantic name called heroin. And uh, because of the word hero, they thought that that's a blessing. But obviously, uh, heroin was not really the cure for morphine addiction. Um, and yet the hero dimension is in our hearts. We, we want, I don't just think women want to be rescued like damsels in distress. I think moms are heroes. Our mom was a hero. In our family, she was the breakout person in our family. I got saved on Mother's Day, uh, crazed, far from God. She hadn't seen me in nine months, but mom's prayers got me. 47 years ago last month. And so being a hero, we all have heroes, I believe that. You may have a sports hero, political hero, war hero, movie hero. There's superheroes now, they're in vogue. I mean, um, how many would like to have bought stock in Marvel? That would have been a good thing <laughs> to do there. But there's all kinds of superheroes and they're still trending right now. Uh, there's male superheroes like Spider-Man, Iron Man, Superman, Batman, Captain America, Panther, Black Panther, Thor. There's female superheroes like Catwoman, Wonder Woman, Mystique, Black Widow, Wasp. And there's mythological superheroes, Hercules, Achilles, Robin Hood. Um, and then there are Bible heroes, Samson, David, Daniel, Esther, Paul, and of course, Jesus. But I believe there's, there's also, we are also called to be family superheroes, mom and dad superheroes. I believe that. So here's the deal. I'm going to be kind of maybe doing some paddles on you today, jump-starting your heart to believe again, to live a heroic life. That's why you're still breathing right now. There's always a moment in time. I remember in just considering this message, I can go back to lots of Father's Day messages. And so I just went through a few of them. And I saw an article about a man who died 10 years ago in our city. 
and he wrote an obituary, his own obituary, and said, to all the grandchildren I never met, I am so sorry. So he did, and it was a good deal. I mean, it was good. A little belated. Timing was not everything there. He should have been a little up to date. But he tried to clean up the oil spill after he was gone. And they've done studies. It's better to clean up the oil spill before you're gone. <laughs> That's better. And so today, and the oil spill in our heart can be, it's too late, I'll never be a hero. I've done so many bad things, how could I ever be a hero? How can I ever do something heroic? Right now, believing the truth about your life, believing, and as we're going to look at a few amazing Bible characters, most of which were unknown quantities. And you even look at what they did and say, why would that be? Well, they made something that was seemingly insignificant become incredible because they were in obedience. So the issue for us is I don't have to write an amazing script for my life. I already have a father who's written an amazing script for my life. And I will prove to you in a second here that you have an amazing script. Because if you as a father or a mother could write the script for your children, how many of you would write an amazing script for them? Let me try that again in English, okay. If you were a parent, a father or a mother, this is a moment to be heroic. Maybe raising your hand right now would be the most exercise you've had in months, okay? So... If you were a father or mother and you could write a script for your children and make it happen, how many of you would want to write a great script for your children? Well, the good news is you have a father in heaven who's capable of doing that. And if you believe his motive and his heart for you is good, which it is, then the God of happy endings has an extraordinary finale for you. I did a video yesterday on Facebook, and I just put it up there, but I just go out, I'm sometimes up in the mountains in my house, and just walk around, and just felt firing a volley on Facebook, and I just love thinking of this thought that, you know, different people, I, I like movies, I'm sure you do too, but not a lot of great movies, candidly, but when someone has a great movie, or someone says, man, the finale of this movie is just incredible. And they're a trusted source. And there are some people I will never trust their advice ever again in the history of the world about their movie idea. Gosh. Um, but if they're a genuinely credible person, they said this ending, then the entire movie, I can't wait for the ending. Well, there's an incredible script writer in heaven who's written a script for you that he says, you know what? There may be some rough spots in your movie. It can be a little delicate here and there, but you just hold on. The finale is going to be amazing. Even now, right now, just going to fight the unbelief. Right right now in the room, any thoughts? No, it's too late. It couldn't happen. You don't understand who I am, what I've done, where I've been. B baloney, get out of the deli section right now. Move out of the baloney section. <laughs> There's a powerful, loving, almighty God in heaven who wrote the script for your life. Today, believing the lie that you're going to, all you're going to have is gravel in your bathing suit when you hit the, the shore. <laughs> I'm I don't care what's happened to you. It doesn't make any difference. What's happened to you is the least significant thing right now. What is most important is you believing, did I just lie to you? that there's a good God who wrote a great script for your life. Or it seems difficult to believe, Francis, but it does make sense. So if it's true, and I don't fully believe it yet, I've got to change. So today, may you be inspired by this, because I'm trying to speak to myself today. Uh, so I want to be a superhero within my family, my marriage, with the people I meet, I, I love one of my daughter's uh, conversations with her fiancé then, who was not stepping up and being the man she was looking for. And this is one of my greatest sentences I've ever heard. And he wasn't stepping up. And so she ran her hand 
on his back and said, honey, what's that? He's thinking there was something wrong. I don't know, I don't know what it is. She said, it's a spine. You can use it anytime you want to. I mean, that was just awesome. And he's an amazing guy. Both my son-in-laws are amazing. But at that moment, step up. You know, don't let a wishbone grow where a backbone should be. You know, we all have God-given desires for purpose, for value. You all want to know, was it worth me being on the planet? And you better be fighting for it. I'm still fighting for it. When I say my best years are ahead, when I crowd surfed out of, out of here, when I wore white pants today, <laughs> I'm making a stinking statement. <laughs> the spirit of Pat Boone came on. <laughs> I didn't even like white pants. <laughs> But I, I was either going to wear white pants or shorts. I just didn't want you to see my legs today. So that's it. It's too much. Nobody wants to see a 70-year-old man's legs. I just think it's the way it is. So I want you to believe as you hear this, this is not for somebody else. Everyone is gone. I'm talking to you. And frankly, I don't get to talk to you that much. So you really should listen. So, number one, how to become one of God's heroes. Stand firm in the reality that God created you with a magnificent purpose. Now, everything's going to fight against that. Everything. Your past. Oh, let's be candid. How many of you today, right now, you are the person you've always wanted to be? Would you just stand? We just want to honor you. Please just stand right now. Don't stop. You are the person, when you look in the mirror, it's just hard to pull away. You are the person, you've always just stick, stand. Huh, maybe it's a human condition. None of us go, I am everything I've ever wanted to be. That's why we're still alive. We are still in process of saying, God, give me another shot at today. This is important, guys. At some point, you may transition from thinking the message maybe is for someone else, but it's not for me, to saying, this message is for me. Again, as a good dad, I've got twins. I am a twin. Equity is very important. So I want everyone. I'm the guy who does. I Listen, at this point in my life, and it's a mystical thing to me, I'd much rather do one-on-one -on -one than share with a crowd. It's just where I'm at. I've shared with lots of crowds. But I get one-on-one -on -one with somebody, I'm fighting for their life. I'm looking you in the eyeball, and I'm saying, I love you, I care about you. This is a turning point for you. So at this moment, I care about every one of you. And this is where I'm focusing, because I don't want anyone to check out and go, not for me, for you. So what it's what's going to take to have that in our hearts, you know, it's going to first of all submit to the reality of who God is and that if he is that powerful and he is a God who is love and if he has called me to be a son and daughter and I've allowed Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life, irrespective of the ups and downs, I believe he's saving the best wine for last. I believe everything the enemy means for evil God's going to turn around for good for my life. So, number two, have courage to fulfill your God-given destiny, not man's. And the fear of man in this age. First, let me just end the suspense. When Christians were spoken of in the New Testament, those who heard of them said, isn't that the group that are hated everywhere? So if you're looking for to be the most popular person on your block, you might not be. If you're expecting America to somehow think Christians are just amazing, individually, 
Hopefully that can happen in that you and your neighborhood, your job, your family, you are a person that is modeling the life of God. And those who know you can say, she is an amazing, he is an amazing person. Genuine, sincere, authentic, humble, the qualities we all long to be. But as far as carte blanche across the board, no. They hated our leader so much, they killed him. Did you know that? Did you hear about that? Our leader was killed. Did he have bad attitudes? Was he not nice, kind, good, loving? I mean, perfect. They killed him. So this is not a question of me uh, finding a faith that is not going to be with negative peer pressure. <laughs> it's more and more coming. And it's coming for those who go to other nations. I mean, Robbie just went to Indonesia. There are scary places on the planet. And America will get more scary. That's what I believe. It's going to get more scary unless there's a mighty move of God, which will still. You know, I saw the movie Paul the Apostle just the last couple of days. And how Christians were hugging each other, saying goodbye as they were going into arenas to be devoured by lions and various things. And just tender moment before Paul's beheaded. He's hugging people, looking in their eye, encouraging. That, you know, it never hit the airwaves, but tens of thousands of Christians have been killed this year on the planet. Well, hit the airwaves. Because they're, not, they're not a trending commodity. <laughs> So, I want to talk to you, I, I do believe that believing God, and even the Bible says, talks about fearing God, brings incredible benefits. Look at a few verses here. Psalm 111. The fear of the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wow. Especially as I get older, I want to be, I want to be a hero, I better have wisdom. Another scripture, Psalm 147. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. I like pleasure. <laughs> I like people to be pleased with me on a certain level, as long as I'm doing something appropriate. And I certainly like mercy. I, I don't want fairness. Please don't treat me fair. I need mercy. <laughs> I do not want God ever to be fair with me. It's not fair. <laughs> I want mercy. I want something I don't deserve. Number three, Proverbs. The fear of the Lord prolongs days. I'm there. Joshua, 110, Moses, 120. I mean, I'm, I'm believing. I believe for 10, 20 more years. Not to be drooling in that seat there. I am believing. Why not? And so when I stopped pastoring, I didn't go out to pasture. I'm trying to jumpstart your hearts too, guys. Because I'm older than most of you in the room. And some of you have already put yourself out the pasture. Quick question. Is God excited about your future? Yes. Yes. Could anyone make a case that God, when he thinks of your future, hmm, I don't know. You've really blown it. Once again, we've all blown it. Who, there are serial sinners in this room everywhere. We've all done things we wish we wouldn't have done. Even now, the things I'm facing, it's not because I'm fearing virile and powerful. If he says in your weakness he'll be made strong, then expect weakness. That's what, I, that's what I'm walking in. And so I'm asking, it's not, you know, when the Bible says if you honor your parents, which is a good day to do that today, that you may live long on the earth, it wasn't like a little curse they threw at the end. <laughs> honor your parents. It doesn't say the good parents, the loving parents, the honor your parents. Bam, that you may live long on the earth. Well, you go, I don't honor them and I don't want to live long. Well, those are two lies you need to stop believing. <laughs> Living long is not a curse, guys. Yeah, we all would like to live long, incredibly healthy, but the chances of your physical body deteriorating a little bit, 
pretty common. 100-year-old people are not as strong as 50-year-old people. But attitudinally, I mean, I, I, sometimes I have to reread things that I had once either written or read that were profound because I've marginalized and minimalized what I remember. And it's better if I read it. I remember I would tell the story about this man who was married 60 years and his wife passed away and he's now in his 90s and I'm giving you now all the elements that I would forget. He's now in a walker. He's come to a rest home. He's sitting in the lobby waiting for hours for them to check him in. He's just sitting there with a good attitude. Finally, the attendant's going to take him to the elevator. He gets to the elevator and the man says, uh, I'm going to take you up to your room now. And, and the old man, 90s, says, oh, I'm going to love it. I can't wait. He said, you haven't even seen it. It's just a little... I mean, he says, seeing the room is not important at all. I've already decided I'm going to love Happiness is something you have to decide before. Yeah. I have decided it's going to be a great day. I have decided I'm going to love my life. The worst thing you can do is wait to see what happens to decide if you want to be happy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's not a question of me making up joy. If the, if the joy of the Lord is my strength, how's God doing? And he's pretty good. I'm with him. So if the joy of the Lord is my strength, if he's not concerned about my future, I'm excited. How are we doing, God? Hey, Francis, your future is, wow, okay, awesome. Let's just keep <laughs> What's happening is the least significant thing. How I'm processing what's happening, most important thing. This I know God is for me. Don't try and persuade me otherwise. So one of my heroes in the Bible, as you might imagine, is an old guy named Caleb. Caleb was one of the original two spies that believed they could take out the giants. Ten of them didn't. But Joshua and Caleb believed for that. I remember reading a book, a pamphlet by C.T. Studd, who was a missionary in Africa. It's called The Chocolate Soldiers. And he was talking about these... Uh, frilly little chocolate Christians who are wrapped in white paper and they melt in the heat of battle. <laughs> I don't want to be a chocolate soldier. I have been. I don't want to be. You know, where are in this age, and let me say this, in this next generation, God's raising up and there's many in this house, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, mighty men and women of God who are going to stand <clears throat> Will it cost you a lot? Absolutely. Today, as I was coming up, I've never used this as a prop before. But this is a little cross, and I'm not, I really, um, for those of us who were here, because I came out of a religious background into Christianity, I became an atheist in between. I wasn't really into religious trappings. I was drowning in religious trappings in my youth. I want a relationship. But the cross is incredibly meaningful. And so when 9-11 happened, we actually sent a team back to New York. And um, we invited police officers. Actually, in the other building, we had four firefighters that came from New York. Uh, and then we had police, a police officer who spoke at our annual police and fire deal. And when he came out, he brought me this, Christian guy which was from 9-11. This is part of the Twin Towers that he went out and made for me. And um, the surprising thing about this is how heavy it is. It's always, and, and so I just looked at it today as I was just getting ready to leave the house. I looked at it and I thought, you know, it may be a heavy burden to imagine being heroic. And, and certainly the cross that we are all called to bear may be heavy. But Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So I'm going to cast my cares upon him because he cares about me. But I want you to understand you have a relationship. So I'm going to pass this around the room. And I want to say this. Thieves go to hell. <laughs> it's, it's just an unfortunate thing. So you guys can do this. I want everyone to touch it. We're going to go. John, would you take this? We're going to go down this aisle. We're going to pass it. You may even have to get up and carry it. 
carry your cross to somebody else. It goes to the back, then it comes back around here, then it goes back there, and then someone faithful will bring it back to my chair. <laughs> Isn't that heavy? Isn't that amazing? No, I know, it'll shock you. Don't just dump that on somebody. They'd make sure they have it before you throw their back out. But, but to me, if we're going to follow Jesus, those who live godly will be... Okay, this is the Bible verse, guys. This is the, you guys are still doing, still doing it. Thank you. Those who live godly will be persecuted. Those who live godly will be persecuted. Doesn't mean you got a giant chip on your shoulder, bad attitude. It was such a simple task. I guess we're going to doing something different. It's very creative. Very creative. Guys, stepping out. It probably was better. Thank you, John. Let's take a take, Caleb. Numbers 14. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit. How many of you want to, I want to have a different spirit? I want to have a different spirit. Yeah. I don't want to be a cultural clone. I don't want to be a moral zombie. I don't want to just be a closet <coughs> Christian. I don't want to, I want to have a different spirit. <coughs> Disposition in him, because he has followed me fully, wholeheartedly. I'm not even going to ask, and none of us have followed God fully. Caleb, God bless you. I'm not going to walk up to Caleb and say, you're talking like you follow God fully, Caleb. <laughs> Apparently he thought he did. And I guess we're talking big issues. Let me say this. Most of the time in our relationship with the Lord, it's more <clears throat> pass-fail than A, B, C, D. Of course, we're all sin and come short of the glory of God. I will bring him to the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Um, so it, it was a life attitude that didn't go away. And for me, he was 85 years old when the next discussion came forth. Joshua 14. Caleb said, remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God. This is now many years later, 40 plus years later about you and me when we were in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old. When Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, I returned and gave from my heart a good report. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above and beyond all we could ask or think, even for the finale of my life. <coughs> Verse 8. But my brothers who went with me were frightened people and discourage them from entering the promised land. For my part, I follow the Lord, my, my God, completely. Fear and discouragement right now, the two things battling all of us, fear of the unknown, fear of tomorrow, fear of failure, and discouragement from past failure. <laughs> fear is usually futuristic, discouragement is usually past, and it can immobilize us in the present. How often will I have to fight this every day? Probably every hour, probably every minute. I will fight you that I am as, as less stable than you are. <laughs> my wife's coming at 11, you can talk to her about it. She will affirm <laughs> that, that my mind is a very, very fluid experience. <laughs> but I have to renew my mind every day. When she married me, she did not know she'd be hearing the Bible a lot. Because I need it. I need it. I'm fighting every day to get my mind clear. So that day Moses promised me the land of Canaan on which you were walking will be your special possession and that your descendants forever because you wholeheartedly follow the Lord my God. Verse 10, now as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive. I'm grateful to be alive. How many of you are grateful to be alive? <laughs> and well he, as well he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise, even while Israel had wandered them, well, today I'm 85 years old. Woo! Verse 11, I'm strong now as when Moses sent me on that journey. 
and I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. I don't know if that's, <laughs> if videotape replay will show Caleb was as strong, but his, his attitude was there, and that's my attitude. Turn to the person next to you and say, that needs to be your attitude too. It needs to be your attitude too. You need that attitude too. Verse 12, so I'm asking you to give me the hill country. Give me this mountain. I love that in the King James. That the Lord has promised me. For you will remember that as scouts we found the Anakites, the giants living there in the land. But the Lord is with me. I will drive them out of the land, just the Lord said. And then verse 13, so Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave Hebron to him as an inheritance. So let me discuss Hebron to Hebron to you. Hebron, Hebron was the burial place of Abraham and Sarah. So there was a generational blessing in conquering that issue. I had to get stuff off me from my father. I did. He died with prostitutes in the room, in the hotel room he died. In. That bothered me when I heard about it. And I didn't hear about it until I was a Christian six, seven, eight, ten years later. Hebron was also a place where David was anointed king. So it's a place of generational blessing and also leadership. We're all called to be leaders, guys. All of us. Every time you open your mouth and someone's listening, you are leading them in some way. Either to have a good day I'm not saying you got to preach to them every moment. I'm saying that when we speak life or death, we're leading. Hebron was also a city of refuge where <laughs> accused murderers could get a fair trial. Wow, a place of forgiveness. I want my life to be a place of forgiveness. I want my inheritance to be a place of forgiveness. And today's a perfect day for that. Generational blessing, spiritual anointing to lead, a place of forgiveness. Those are the three things. So Caleb had a next. I have a next. You have a next. Are you prepared for God's next? Are you believing for God's next? The Rock of Roseville had a next. And beyond Brandon and Rachel, there will be a next. And they're raising up a next generation. That's why it made it so much easier in the transition, because they had done already a great job in raising up a next generation that they have led and continue to lead. Number three, don't give up. Don't give away. Your final is th I'm not going to have more than three numbers here. Don't give away your call to greatness. What does that mean, greatness? Greatness means being obedient. That's all that means. He never asked me what I think. God's never said, Francis, what do you think? <laughs> never happened. <laughs> he already says, you know what? My thoughts, they're really not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As to heaven is high above the earth, so are my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about someone you probably have never heard of, Joshebed. Anyone know who Joshebed was? <laughs> Joshebed was the mother of Moses, who when Pharaoh was killing little boys that were Hebrew, she put him in a basket and prayed, God bless my son. And as the little boat floated down the river, one of Pharaoh's progeny picked up the child, raised him in Pharaoh's home. And Moses became the deliverer. But Joseph had watched him then grow up. There he is, my son. It takes faith, guys, for you to take your future and cast it on the water and say, God, I, I believe that my future is in your hands. Are you ready to do that for your future today? My mother prayed for me. I got saved on Mother's Day. A mother can pray. You know, every, everyone can be clear with hindsight. But the question is, can you be clear with foresight? Right now, this is a message today. 
Father's Day is foresight. Here's another hero you never heard of. This is my last hero. Rizpa. Anyone know who Rizpa was? She was the father of Riz. <laughs> Rizpa. So here it is. Second Samuel 21. David gave... This is, a, this is a battle going on. Okay, brief story. King Saul, bad guy. David takes over for him. He's the guy that wanted to kill David. But King Saul went down to a bloody death. And his descendants, and he had hurt a lot of people. And in those days, for whatever reason, you take out relatives. And so David gave to people who wanted to put the sons of Saul, or the grandsons, to death. Five sons. These were the children of Saul's daughter, Mirab. Then in verse 9, a concubine named Rizpah had two additional children. And what happened here? The mother of these two men, so all seven were killed, five from a daughter, two from a concubine, spread sackcloth so that her two sons are dead. She spread sackcloth on a rock and stayed there the entire harvest season. She prevented vultures from tearing at their bodies during the day and stopped wild animals from eating them at night. Now you think, what a hopeless cause. <laughs> and why would she do that? What if God asked you to do something that appeared hopeless on earth but had incredible value in eternity? This is not a question of, is it going to work on earth? doesn't make any difference. The question is, is God asking me to do it? So she spent day and night, five months vigil. And I just would say to you, for those of you who have children that are far away from God, it's not too late for you to fight for your children today. You're still breathing. You still have spiritual authority. You're still a father or mother. They're still your descendants. You're, you're hearing this message intentionally by God. Fight in the spirit for your children. Amen. My mother did. All five of her kids got saved. Still saved today. She's been gone 20 years. Rizpah's action then did something. By what Rizpah did, David, who allowed the king, who allowed the whole thing to take place, he heard this woman day and night was fighting to keep Vultures and animals from devouring her son's bodies and slept on the ground next to him. And David heard about it. Verse 11, when David learned that Rizpah, Saul's concubine, had done, he went to the people of Jabesh Gilead and asked for the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan. Verse 13, so David, can someone come to a keyboard please? So David brought the bones of Saul and Jonathan as well as the bones of the men of, Gib of the Gibeonites had executed. He buried them all in a tomb of Kish, Saul's father at the town of Zila in the land of Benjamin. After that, God ended the famine that was in the land. So Rizpah, day, night, fighting vultures from attacking the dead body of her children, dead bodies of her sons so impacted David that he did the right thing. He, he released on a deeper level. Not just Saul. He was close friends with Jonathan. But Jonathan did not have to die with Saul. And I think it bummed David out. My friend Jonathan, he shouldn't have died. And so a famine was stopped. Rizpah helped stop a famine. Rizpah provoked a king to do the right thing. An unknown person's heroic act changed the heart of a king. How about you today, guys? What heroic 
act can you do? Maybe it's forgiving someone who's hurt you. Maybe it's calling someone you've lost touch with. Maybe it's looking in the eyes of your kids and saying, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to be there for you. We are all breathing with potential. We're all breathing with possibilities ahead for each one of us. My future is no easier than your future. I, I can assure you when I'm 110, it's going to be challenging. The issue is what a measure of faith do we have right now for our future? And are you and I willing? I think of Dr. King's quote, I may not, have, may not be the man I want to be, may not be the man I could be, but I thank God I'm not the man I was. I'm still in process. This message is as, as much in play for me as it is for you. So I'm going to invite you to, to take a step toward your future. The Bible says we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. If you are ready to say toward your future, I want to live a heroic life. I want to believe God for a great finale for my life. I want to trust the script he's written for me is infinitely better than the script I could write for myself. And today I want, to, I want to take a stand. I'm going to put a stake in the ground saying that's who I am, that's who he is, and that's what my, fu my future is bright because I'm trusting him. And I believe him. He's not a man he should lie. He's, he's promised, I believe, exceedingly abundantly better than I can ask or think. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. So if you're with me, I'm standing right now. Would you stand, please, and say, that's my future. That's my God. I may, I may not have wanted to stand prior to this message, but today I'm going to stand. Don't straight-arm God right now. Please don't. don't. Don't bow to unbelief and discouragement like the ten spies who never, never, their bones bleached in the wilderness, the Bible says. Be a Joshua, be a Caleb. I'm going to go into the promised land. I'm going, to, I'm going to be an Esther. If I perish, I perish, but I will not bow down. Father, we stand in your presence today, Lord. I thank you for these men and women. Every one of us fight. Paul, you said it. outside we're fightings, inside we're fears. All of us battle stuff, Lord. But we will not bow down. We will not believe that our future is dismal. We believe our future is bright because we trust the, the one who wrote the script for our lives. So I want you to repeat after me these words, if you would, please. Save them from a heart that is trusting, faith-filled. Heavenly Father, thank you for creating me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you that my future is bright because you wrote the script. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. You died for my sins. You overcame sin and death and were victorious that I might be victorious. You are my hero. Give me a heroic life that I may live for you and be obedient to be and do whatever you ask me to be and do. In the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Give God a hand today. Amen.